Hey everyone, uh, in this episode, I'm joined by Jack Porter Smith, Managing Director of WSI Paid Search. Uh, we sit down and we talk about where marketers can stop wasting money on paid search. Uh, Jack really sort of dives in and breaks down his approach to programmatic campaigns, display ads, retargeting, uh, you know, as well as the challenges and opportunities in search today. Uh, including the most recent changes in third-party data policies, as well as what drives decision makers to invest in paid search advertising in the first place. So let's get into it. I started WSI Paid Search eight years ago, 2013. Um, it's a joint venture with WSI. So WSI, um, obviously, is half of the name. Um, they are a, a juggernaut of uh, sort of internet marketing consulting space. Um, hundreds, if not over a thousand offices around the world, but specifically my venture with them was more on the delivery side, as opposed to the consulting side, um, as it relates to, uh, online advertising. So it seemed like a good idea to call it WSI paid search in 2013 and seemed a little bit out of date now, so I might need to do some rebranding. Um, because obviously it's not just paid search, it's, um, you know, paid social programmatic display and video advertising. Um, but in simple terms, simple ads is Google ads, Facebook ads, Microsoft ads is more or less what we do. All day, every day. So in, in terms of the, the agency and the, and the branding, um, you know, in terms of the day to day, what are you, what kind of campaigns are you running? You said programmatic display uh search yeah. obviously so what's the typical client kind of relationship look like so the, the typical situation is we don't meet many clients who have never done this um as in hey we're a new business and we're entirely new to advertising uh, all right you get the occasional perhaps more industrial b2b who need to pivot from more traditional methods to online but for the most part um we're actually kind of fixers is the best way to put it. You know, most of the situations we inherit, um, are because, uh, we're fixing a problem and that problem is usually either we're trying to do this in-house, but we've realized the complexities, uh, and challenges to scaling that effectively. So we need outside help or, um, we had another agency who we're no longer pleased with. We need a, a better or different one. So that's almost always the, the scenario, meaning, um, you know, you don't necessarily have the benefit of starting from scratch with a fresh slate, which is a different scenario, but it's a one that we're very used to. And um, the typical client doesn't exist. You know, I, I, I see a lot of agencies that do specialize in healthcare or whatever it might be, certain verticals, niches, um, but my philosophy has always been that, um, there's so many transferable learnings between each project, each client, you know, one might be a nationwide not-for-profit, you know, cancer charity, um, and you learn something from that and you apply it to a B2B financial services client, and then you apply something from that to a plumber, um, in terms of, you know, just the you know, tricks that you see working and opportunities. So. I've always felt that diversity keeps your skills sharp. And so, you know, we have a few hundred clients and they're all different. And I'm, some of them spend a few thousand dollars a month. Some of them spend millions of dollars a year. It's, uh, yep. it's all, uh, all the same to us. Yeah. It, so you, you take the tried and true tested tactics, uh, and strategies that work and these, you know, in paid search, uh, these other uh, other, other tactics, right. And then what you'll do mm -hmm. is you'll apply them to the verticals that, you know, are coming in and yeah. like, applying it to their specific use case. Yeah. And it's a bit, it's a bit like a, you know, a personal trainer at a gym, you know, yep. um, they might see someone like me come in the door, still a little bit festively plump in the summer. Right. And you know, the, you know, they can see the solution. They know what to do. They've seen a hundred different people. They've seen different regimes and workouts and diets. So for them, they've seen results. They know what to do. 
yeah, they're yeah. seeing the results exactly of their of their work, of their advice. So, so in some ways, the client is the slightly overweight or out of shape person you know, coming into the gym. And our job is just to develop a program to whip them into shape. And sometimes their issue is a lack of growth. Sometimes it's a lack of profitability. Sometimes it's a lack of I mean diversity in terms of their mix, in terms of brand awareness, brand consideration, brand action. So yeah, in a, in a way of speaking, you know, just from our experience, we see the plight, we understand their needs and we develop the program to solve it. Now, Google uh, search shopping and marketing are the workhorses of our environment. You know, they're like the treadmills in the exercise boats, you know, they, they, uh, they must account for about 70% of our business. Just because for so many businesses, that's the foundation of any online advertising campaign, right? If someone is asking for what you have, give it to them. It's a fairly simple philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, just like if you're overweight, stop eating cakes. And I should say to myself. Um, and so, you know, that, that is a huge part of what we do. And then usually as people branch out, you know, they've got the foundation taken care of with search, shopping, remarketing. Yeah. They then see the re results from that, right? The return on spend, and then they begin to explore and trust and branch out into things like video advertising or social display or programmatic display. So is that less tangible? Right. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I so I was, I, I did it. I did a, uh, a LinkedIn post on this earlier this week where we were, I was, I was sort of talking about how, uh, well, the shift, uh, just recently last or the announcement last week with Google, you know, extending, you know, the yeah. of, of third party cookies. Right. And we, I don't know, uh, e e <laughs> I, I, I sort of, I sort of explained it to somebody as this is not supposed to be looked at like, oh, I get an extra, you know, couple of years out of this whole thing. Yeah. You know, the, the sort of the party can continue on, you know, using third party cookies. I think it represents a really good opportunity to set yourself apart by doing it right and doing it well. Yes. Use retargeting. I mean, use it. You know, use cookie based retargeting because it works, right? I mean, we all we all know that. Um, but to take it much further and give yourself an opportunity to be able to uh, start now developing a playbook that is going to survive well beyond <laughs> cookies and beyond the short term tactics and the, the hacks and the tricks and things like that that are going to yeah. um, you know, be short lived. And I, I sort of equated it to 2011 when, you know, the Panda SEO update came out, right? All of the short term hacks and tricks yeah. were very much short lived, right? They went away. Everybody, you know, the, you know, everybody was all of a sudden, you know, SEO was devastated. You know, these companies were, were just destroyed, uh, or did the ones that were doing it, uh, these short term tactics were sort of just, just decimated. And then the ones that were doing it well, the ones that were doing it right, they were creating useful content that people were reading, that were people were pen, you know, spending time on site and actually consuming, you know, clicking through multiple pages uh, to be able to, to, you know, see relevant content that they felt like was useful to them because they were getting something out of it. They were coming back because of branded search, yeah. you know, um, and, and those, those are the brands that we know and we love today, right? Those are the ones that we see today because they started back then. And I think we have the exact same opportunity today, right? Is we have this chance to be able to know what's going to happen, like with certainty, right? And, and make a choice. We can make a choice to be able to double down and invest in areas that are going to be, you know, branded demand gen. Uh, you know, building a brand, uh, developing a podcast, what have you, right? That are useful ways to be able to create an audience and then capture that demand with performance marketing at the bottom of the funnel and, and do it right and do it well. And, and I just wonder, you know, and, and I, I just wonder what your, your thoughts on that are. No, I, I love that. And 
I think our brains work in very similar ways because the parallel that I drew from, well, would draw from the last 18 months of everyone panicking slash scaremongering about the death of third party cookies, which as you said, is now, you know, basically delayed to the end of 2023, really, two years from now. Yeah. Uh, uh, this feels so similar to in 2012, 13, when everyone started panicking about GDPR and uh, EU cookie legislations, going back to then, and you know, that's really when the sort of opt-in notices and everything like that started becoming required and big fines started getting handed out. Yeah. So that was breaching and again, all of our clients at the time, everyone around me was kind of up in arms and like you said, looking for walkarounds, hacks, exceptions. And I just remember thinking, and I ended up just saying to my clients, look, these policies, um, uh, changes in legislation, changes in the way the internet works, they're never geared at hurting people who are not doing anything wrong. Right. If you're panicking from these legislative changes or these policy changes or these kind of tectonic, you know, browser changes, it generally means you're probably doing something you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> um, it's kind of like if you're speeding along a road at 50 miles an hour and you know, it's a 30 and then someone tells you there's actually a speed camera put up. It's that's how it feels to me. And so, yeah. like you said, it. If you've been over leveraging advertising methodologies that depend on third party data, you know, you, yes, you've had a, a reprieve, right? You've had a, you know, potentially two year reprieve and it's time to sort of get the house in order. Like you said, I don't think that means anything to do with, you know, advertising and marketing based on cookies is taboo or bad, but it shouldn't be your meat and potatoes. Right, your, your meat and potatoes should be first party and or earned stuff. Yes. And the third, you know, I, I've always just looked at the third party stuff and it's, you know, it's the gravy on top of the meat and potatoes. It's, yeah. it's a sprinkling of a random experiment or some surplus audience or in some way, any not very important, cool that works, cool that doesn't work, but we don't really need it option. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm. And so it, I, I actually almost just find it funny when I, when I see people running around panicking because, uh, like you said, the, their attention's in the wrong place, you know, instead of looking for ways to continue, uh, maybe not advertising in a privacy respectful manner, uh, their, uh, you know, their attention should just be on how do we get cleaner in the future, right? Like as you said, it's an interesting time. It is. I I think the other thing, what what you said struck something or struck a chord with me where I was thinking about nobody was singled out either, right? The playing field is exactly the same for everyone. And so the new playing field is going to be something different. And the question is, is are you going to adapt to something that's different and find a way to win in other areas? that are you know going to going to not involve things like that they're going to involve building an audience they're going to be involving other types of ways to to uh build demand for your product educate customers on their pain points make them aware and then bring them in so that you can capture them uh and and so i think you know that that kind of aspect of it is really what i'm most most interested in is is what are the new ways that are sustainable going forward, you know, that are going to be able to create and then capture that demand? Uh, so we've been spending a lot of time just internally on our team looking at the different ways that our advertisers are doing that. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I, most people on this podcast sort of know this, but I mean, we we look we have we have some really we have a really interesting vantage point right now, which is probably similar to you, uh, Jack, where we look at a cross section of uh, advertisers that are in pretty much every vertical you can think of from, you know, tra uh, travel, tra uh, hospitality, transportation, healthcare, finance, e-commerce, you, yeah. you know, different types of verticals, the whole bit. 
And we see a really interesting cross section of what's working and what's not working, you know, across, you know, thousands of campaigns. And it gives us access to a sort of a view into or a microcosm of what's happening, you know, across the web. And, um, and so one of the things that, that I'm looking for are sort of those patterns of where people are, are, are diverging and, and having success from the pack. And then, you know, we're looking at, you know, these other outliers that sort of show us, you know, what's working and what's not working. Uh, and, and then, you know, taking that and, and, um, and, 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 and seeing, you know, seeing where those, seeing where those successes are coming from. Uh, do you, I mean, you see that I'm sure, right. I mean, you, you know, what that playbook is that you work, um, yeah. of, of the best practices, uh, and then you apply it to specific verticals. I mean, is there a, is that, I'll, I'm just going to pick B2B for example, uh, just real quick, just because, uh, in a B2B playbook for you, what does that look like when you come in and you look at a campaign or sorry, you look at a, you look at a brand and they have a relatively long sales cycle. Um, maybe they're selling software or, uh, you know, some sort of high ACV yeah. product. Yeah. Uh, what is the, what's the, what's the approach that you typically take when you come in? I'll, I'll add to that in a sec, but what you said is really interesting. We're just about watching what's going on. Again, it's, it's kind of touch upon what we said right at the start is, um, you know, with the unexpected consequences of COVID, because on the one hand, there are businesses who are logically doing very well on this, that they're just mm. perfectly positioned. Let's, let's take a, a garden furniture company. You know, of course, everyone's been stuck in the gardens for a year and a half and they're going to be sold out. But for example, there are other things that you'd never really anticipate. So for example, one of our clients is B2B and B2C actually, um, they sell prefabricated buildings made out of steel and, um, again, they have a brilliant year, uh, for whatever reasons, they had a great year and there's a huge demand, but, um, because of COVID now we have a, a COVID hangover almost 14 months later, where I'm sure if you've seen in the news, there are steel shortages and timber shortages as well. So. Now we're in a situation where demand is through the roof, client appetite is through the roof, uh, their consumer appetite is through the roof, but we can't do it. <laughs> There's no bloody steel left. Um, so we, yeah, on the one hand, it, again, it just comes back to sort of trying to live in the moment and not get too far ahead of yourself because we're in such a volatile place. For the B2B question, um, Oftentimes, you know, like you said, whenever they might be as a service provider, a software provider, something of that nature, um, the, the first thing you've got to ask yourself is do people know who that, you know, what they are, is anyone actually looking for them? Mm -hmm. That is just literally the first time where, you know, if we, we get a request in tomorrow and say, this is the B2B company in the first nanosecond, that's the first thing we're thinking. Is anyone looking for what you do? Do they know even to look for it? Do they know they need you? Because that's the low hanging fruit, right? With search advertising. So that's often the biggest challenge with, with the B2B spaces. Sometimes what the, the company can do is a niche within a niche within a niche in the B2B world where no one knows who they are or what they do or even to look for them, even if they can't solve a problem, provide a great product. But nonetheless, that's where we start. And I think something that's really been wonderful for us is B2B demographic detail targeting research, which is a beta on Google ads. And a simple example that I always use, um, I was actually, uh, you know, this Eric, but no one else here knows who I am, but we do a lot of events in non pandemic times. And a lot of them are with Google. And one of them was in Washington, DC about two years ago. And I was talking about a lot of stuff to do with growth and advertising. And one of the delegates came to me afterwards and she said, that was really interesting and all great in theory, but it's useless for me. And I thought, okay, it's 
interesting feedback as soon as I'd come off stage. And she said, no, I, I, I mean, I don't know, everything you said sounds amazing about the potential for growth and all this stuff, but I'm a solar panel company, right? We install the solar panels. And I said, okay, so what's the problem? And she said, well, we only do commercial installations on farms, factories, shopping malls, you know, mm. this type of thing, not homes, yeah. uh, which is, uh, to say that, you know, when, when she thought about search advertising, someone searches for solar panels, um, nine times out of 10, maybe more, that's probably going to be a homeowner, right? Someone wants to put it on their house. Right. And, uh, the thing is Google's made us lazy, Eric. Right. Then there was a time when you actually had to tell Google what you wanted. Now just start typing half a word and Google will figure out the rest. It knows who right. you are. It knows your behavior. It knows what you want. So you don't need to go on to Google and say, Hey, my name's Eric. Please can I have a pair of size 11 blue running sneakers? Just start typing sneaker and you'll get what you want. Um, so this, this Google making us lazy has actually made it really hard for B2B advertisers. Um, but on the other hand, it presents an opportunity because by the same token of nine out of 10 searches being probably domestic in nature and residential, there is an opportunity that, you know, because, because of the laziness, the, the factory owner, the shopping mall owner is not going to go on Google and say solar panel company for shopping malls. They're just going to say solar panels. The opportunity we have though. Now with B2B is we can lean into unqualified generic broad search terms, which used to be the absolute no, no. Like if you did that, you would get fired from any agency or job. They do it. But now I think with the advances of, uh, audience targeting layered with something like search advertising, it's very much realistic and possible. So with B2B demographic targeting for search, mm. this company could bid on just the keyword solar panel. So they can stay and play with the volume keyword, uh, cause nobody searches for commercial solar panels, but then they can filter it to only show to people in, you know, construction, healthcare, manufacturing, transportation, whatever industries they want to serve. Mm. So that's been a huge game changer. Um, and it's opened a lot of opportunities for these, um, uh, B2B organizations who have either overlap with B2C world or just a really obscure product. Yeah. Yeah. So not a lot of search volume for commercial solar panels in Idaho, right? <laughs> uh, but what you're doing is, is you're overlaying against that, you know, specific audience targeting to be able to drive, you know, drive, uh, drive quality traffic specifically to a, you know, a dedicated, you know, longer form landing page, right? Captures information, et cetera. And then I'm assuming you're just retargeting against them, you know, at $5 CPMs or something like that on both web and social, uh, yeah, exactly. and creating sort of a playbook around that. Right. Uh, and then doing some exclusions to be able to make sure that you're having, you know, you're, you're basically, once you've captured them, you know, you can keep that messaging in front of them. And then what does the retargeting playbook sort of look like? Is it. Are you driving them to a particular offer or are you driving them to additional content to consume? How does that, how does that work? Maybe it just depends on channel, right? Depends a lot on channel and I think the nature of the client, um, you, you know, for example, with e-commerce clients, uh, it's more about the timing than necessarily, uh, what you're bringing them back to. I mean, if they cart abandoned in the last 24 hours, fairly strong chance that they come back to the same product page without any changes to the scenario, it'll do the job. Right. But, mm -hmm. um, in some cases, yeah, you need to maybe be a bit more creative with kind of alternate landing pages or special lockers to pull them over the line. Um, I don't know why I'm telling you that you are, you are the remarketing experts. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think, I think it's interesting. So in my experience, it's based on both where, obviously where they are in the funnel, you know, in the decision-making process, uh, and then also by channel as well. Right. So you're on 
for example, you're on Facebook, you're on LinkedIn, you, you're not sort of in in buying mode necessarily uh, for a B two B product. I'm I'm sp- I'm going to stick down the B two B lane. Yep. Um, so in based on that, what you're doing is is you're looking at it and saying, hey, there's you know a you know a reasonable chance that they're there to look at pictures of their kids or their, their grandkids, right? Uh, not so much to make a purchasing decision around a piece of software, right? So, so really the, the, the question becomes, what do you serve them? Because your perfect customers sitting on Facebook right now, right? Uh, anybody in B2B who doesn't think that Facebook is, is a good channel for them has not had a good, you know, a good experience with either their agency or in-house, but, uh, their customers are on Facebook. The question is, is what do you serve them and when and how, uh, and, you know, I think, you know, that's, that is how you sort of have to look at it, right? You cannot look at it like it's like one size fits all. You've got to, you got to yeah. very specifically slice it up based on channel and based on stage and the phone. Yeah. I and mean, we've actually. So that was a point to carry on your Facebook B2B example. Like you said, they're, you know, they're not necessarily in the right moment to purchase because they're about to flush the toilet, right? Right. Like you just never know at what point would cost them. Right. Um, and then, so as an example, if your ask is quite heavy, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, you need to, you know, it's, I'm, when I say ask, I mean the call to action of the original, uh, intent campaign, whatever it was that got them into your remarketing list. In fact, quite a heavy ask, like maybe setting up an account, entering credit card details, purchasing something, whatever it might be. Um, if you're remarketing um, something like Facebook, for example, a, a easy path of least resistance is just to run a Facebook lead gen ad and all you're asking for is their email. That's it. It's like, Hey Frank. Saw you were checking out our software. You didn't create your account yet. Put your email in here. And, you know, someone will be in touch and a better time. Mm-hmm. And that, that's a more realistic ask than click here and do everything we asked you to do the first time. But you know, you're going to do that because you're on your cell phone. Like you said, looking at pictures of your grandkids, right. Uh, on a train, whatever you're doing, right? Yep. Yeah, in, in my experience, one of the things that we have seen that's that it has um, just across most B two B advertisers is is actually bringing those people to uh, a, a you know they're showing them a video right and they're consuming that particular piece of content. They may click through to see something else and they save it, uh, but more often than not, it's, it's really upper funnel and awareness, uh, rather than just trying to get them to click through, you know, to make a purchase. Uh, uh, now that really works for, I mean, I, I think I should, it's probably worth saying this is for B2B. If you're talking about like a D2C brand, then yeah, you know, you're going to click through and, you know, if it's a quick, you know, relatively frictionless process and it's a low average order Mm -hmm. value ticket price or something, you can, Mm -hmm. you can pick up you know, a reasonably decent, uh, conversion rate. Um, but if it's a, I need to get on a demo to see this product, right. <laughs> then it's a completely different sale. And, and then what ends up happening is, you know, the, the types of content that you serve, you know, is, is applicable based on, you know, on those use cases. So, um, yeah. and, and what's fascinating to me is, is, you know, the, the, the marketers that we see using our platform, you know, they like the ones that sort of run that play, um, uh, are, are the ones that we are seeing that are winning. Uh, uh, I'm, so I, I have a, I have a question, uh, if, if, if it's okay. So there's, so I'm here for you're in, <laughs> you're in a unique, <laughs> you're in a unique position, right? You're, you're working with decision makers all day long, uh, either as active clients or potential clients. Um, I am fascinated by what gets the decision maker to make 
make the call, you know, to work with you. So, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm an, a, I'm a, I'm a client in, you know, at a, in a D to C brand. Uh, I have, you know, I've had an agency, but I wasn't super thrilled with them. I'm looking for other solutions. I, somebody referred me over to you and now we're having a conversation. Um, yeah. how as, and, and let's say that I, I guess I should give more context. So I'm the decision maker and I'm also the guy that has the purse strings. Right. Yeah. And, and so I control the purse strings. I control the budget. I'm thinking in my head, you know, uh, you know, as a business owner and, you know, I'm, you know, I'm doing 10 or, you know, 20 million a year in, in revenue for a, you know, a widget that I'm selling on an e-commerce site on Shopify. What, what is, how, how do you convince me that doing more paid search is going to give me you know, the ROI that I need uh, or, or, programmatic or the suite of things that you offer yeah. uh, in performance marketing. Uh, I've been burned once, right? I poured tons and tons of money down the, down the sink. Uh, how do you sort of readjust my expectations and, and, you know, what do you say to, what do you say to somebody like that? Well, that, that's a very common scenario. Um, Listen, in, in, in the end years I've, I've gone this agency and the hundreds, if not thousands of conversations, just like that, we must have had, uh, in fact, it would be thousands because we have hundreds of clients. So I think absolutely it would be thousands over eight years. Mm -hmm. Um, something I've always deliberately chosen to do is not to convince anyone to do anything. Um. And all we aim to offer is help grounded with reason. And that that's really always been our approach. So if you were to hire us to solve problems, seize an opportunity, like you said, sell more of your widgets, double over the next three years, your size of your business, whatever it is, you know, I'm with you on that hope and the reason, right? What is, what is the reason that that's grounded with? Is it we've done an audit of your pre-existing campaigns? And we can find errors. Is it we can find the missed opportunity? Um, is it that uh, you know you you've just never done this thing before? And and for us, uh, we actually have a full page of our every proposal we send, and it's it says discovery campaign mindset. Exactly what it says. And it's a full page, basically saying what I'm saying now is there are no guarantees. Don't ask me to promise anything because I'm not going to. But, uh, we believe that what you hope for is out there and we'd like to, uh, run in a three month experiment to, to try and find it for you. And, and, um, it's going to be perfectly tangible. Black and white. Did it work? Did it not work? Did elements work? Did elements not work? And, and once we find, uh, the, the, the predictable part of it, right. In other words, typically what is happening on the daily, weekly, monthly basis, well then make sure that it's, uh. It's a strategy that is predictable, uh, repeatable and scalable, but quite honestly, Eric, I've never asked anyone to work with us and I never will, because I feel like if you just present your best self and uh, help, you know, it all comes down to the help, like we said at the start, provide free consultations, execute free audits, uh, free research. Yeah. Um, and, and oftentimes, like you said, it is about tempering down expectations. Um, one time, genuinely, just a real quick story. Yeah. Someone came to us and said, Hey, we're a, a super duper tech company. We have, uh, developed the world's most secure smartphone. And I thought, interesting. And they were like, future presidents are going to be using this. Every diplomat on the planet is going to be using these, you know, super secure smartphones, wealthy people, import business people, celebrities. And I was like, cool. And they were like, so can you develop a plan for us to sell a million units, please? <laughs> I was like, uh, why do we try to sell a hundred first? Right. So, um, that, that's always been our mindset as well is listen, you can take over the world, but maybe let's try and, you know, do a village first and, yes. 
actually, I think tempering expectations down uh, is important and is, is what makes it an easy, non-threatening decision for people to work with us because everything we say is just grounded in, if not drowned in business logic and business reasoning. And uh, I think that's what people relate to the most is, is just seeing things from their perspective, but also making sure they're, they're having a realistic outlook. So there's so much to sort of unpack there, right? Uh, so the, <laughs> the, the disarming approach of, you know, taking somebody who's coming to you and saying, I'm got a problem and a pain point that I think you might be able to solve are the, the best clients that, that you're going to want to work with. Right. And so most of these people I'm assuming are coming inbound. These are not people that you're doing any kind of outreach to. It doesn't sound like you do that at all. Uh, some agencies do, right? Yeah. Some agencies do, some agencies don't. In your particular case, you're not. Uh, so those are the people that already know and recognize that they have a pain, right? These are the ones that already know that they've got a problem that they need solving and that they think maybe you're the one to solve it. And then what you're doing is, is you're giving them a very sort of disarming, uh, uh, analytical approach, you know, based on data and experience of what's working and what's not working. And then also, uh, perhaps separating yourself from the outcome, right. Uh, which you have a, you know, a unique position to be in, right. As, as, you know, the decision maker in your organization, if you're talking about, uh, a sales organization who is very obviously performance motivated, you know, they've got to, they've got to schedule demos, they've got to close deals. Maybe it's an AE type position that, that approach that you are taking right there is, is so hard to teach an AE. Uh, so an AE is going to go in, they're going to say, I'm, I'm, I've got to, I've got to close X number of dollars in MRR this, this month, or I've got to close X number of deals this month, whatever they're you know, whatever their comp metrics are. And, yeah. and you're saying, well, yeah, I have the same exact goal. I've got MRR goals. I've got number of deals, you know, those sorts of things to, to continue to infuse and grow my business. But you, you've approached it completely different. You said, okay, I am going to, I'm going to sort of divorce myself from the outcome and just give the best possible advice. And then what ends up ultimately happening in that particular scenario. And I, I don't know what, you know, if you guys track close rates or anything, but in my experience, those, the opposite happens. Uh, and it's very hard to teach an AE, but if you, if you separate yourself from the outcome and you just help and provide advice and give them experience and give them context and color and, and case, like case studies, not in the traditional format, but experience-based case studies of something that's happened good or not good with a particular client in their situation, what ends up happening is you build credibility in the, in the conversation. And then what ends up happening is you end up winning that person's trust and ultimately closing that more of that business than you would if you're following a callback cadence. Right. And, that, and I'd love to, to go a bit deep on this because it's, it's applicable to anyone and everyone. If an agency is watching this, if, if a business serves their own type of clients, because it's just the same principle. It's just a different business service or product we all have. Almost anyone that buys from us on a monthly basis, like you said, in our, um, they've seen us on stage, they've read a book, they've watched a video. Uh, we've given them a free consultation, a free audit. We've spent countless hours answering free questions. Um, and one time, I, I, we never asked for anything. That's the thing. But they're always waiting for the catch and it doesn't exist. Uh, they're like, you sent me a proposal, but you haven't been fetched in. Well, of course I have. They're waiting on the, they're waiting for the other suit to drop. Yeah. 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 And, um, uh, but for us, it's just in our DNA. We didn't even do it on purpose. It's just who we are. Just help people. Good things will happen, right? The bank of goodwill. But one example that I um, never forget is there was this company that I've been helping and I'm in a lot of questions 
just needs and challenges. And so we got friendly, met in conferences, saw me on, you know, stage a few times, met a lot of my team members, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and one day I happened to be in Toronto, uh, where they are, where they're based. And uh, I was taking a large group out for dinner again, not with any agenda, I wasn't going to ask for anything. And I specifically put in the invitation, do not talk business, right? Uh, just relax. And, um, so he's, he happens to be sat next to me at, din at the dinner table after about four hours of cocktails. And he just said to me, Jack, why are you so nice to us? Like, we don't buy anything from you. We don't make any money for you. We don't, you know, have anything gone with you. Um, and you've never asked for anything and said, you'll see, uh, I'm just developing a relationship. Um, and, uh, he just couldn't understand him. Like why he literally said, why are you being so nice to us? Just because I bought him dinner and a couple of drinks. Mm. Um, fast forward to today. Again, I had never asked him for anything. They now spend about 30 grand a month with us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's not to sound like any devious strategy. It's quite the opposite. It's just be nice. Yeah. Help people. Don't need to ask for anything. It'll come. Yeah. And of course. It won. I, 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 that, that approach is very difficult to justify, you know, when you're, let's say you're series A funded and you're trying to grow really fast and you've got people yeah. that, you know, really aggressively trying to grow a business, uh, and scale, uh, and, and taking that, like sort of taking that, that approach that you're talking about where it does take a little bit longer, but in my experience, uh, what tends to happen in a situation like that? And, and the thing that you sort of, I think I want to highlight you, you sort of skip past it. Uh, uh, it went to the, the dinner sort of, uh, point, but you did a whole lot of things before that you were speaking yeah. at events, you were talking to them, you were giving them advice, you were developing content that, you know, specifically address their particular needs, their particular issues. And you were creating that demand well before they ever had their first conversation with you, right? Yeah. And then they had the conversation with you. And 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 that conversation was one that set you up as the authority, you know, with credibility. Um, it, it sets the table completely different Yeah. Uh, when you're trying to, you know, when you're having a conversation, um, you know, and then you just, you just took it further. You just went, you know. Yeah. You went the extra mile with the dinner and, and everything else. Ah, uh -huh. yes, for sure. Yeah. So the important so thing that is that, that that is true, but like, and I get that it's a fairly extreme example. You know what I mean? But even mm -hmm. to, to, to take your point, well, you know, some people might be listening, thinking, well, that's nice for you. But, you know, like you said, we've got targets, we've got yep. volume, we're funded. Yeah. The approach still works. Believe me, I haven't sat here not growing my business for eight years. Um, and so, uh, especially as if you're a, you know, founder of a small business or a small team, and then begin to grow out your business development team around you, um, yeah. they need to, uh, adopt your philosophy and your approach and shadow for a long time and go through all your SOPs. But yeah. what, what, what I'd like to say is, you know, listen, like any other business we're we're here to grow, uh, by, by the people we serve around ourselves and then. You know, so for example, we do no, nothing cold. So every conversation we ever have is warm, um, one way or the other. So for one example, we practice what we preach, right? We run search advertising for our search advertising services. So if somebody searches for Google ads agency in North America, I guarantee you, they will see an ad for WSI paid search. And so they go into our funnel, right? Into our sales pipeline. And just like any other business, that pipeline has about 15 different stages. They need to be updated and they, and they need to have outcomes. Yep. So once someone is into that funnel, they've said, Hey, I want to work with you. I mean, you best believe we're efficient. You'll have your consultation within a matter of hours. You have your proposal with well thought out research and audits and recommendations within a matter of hours after that. And you're going to have lots of compelling reasons, hope backed up by reason to convert. So yep. it, it still works at scale and to a system, but it's not that kind of what you're describing sort of high pressure outbound push, 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 
twist people's arms. Because if you get it right at the very start, before the final even exists, the damn thing closes itself. Yeah. Right? You, you and I are so, so oh, we're in so much alignment. I can't tell, tell you. Uh, so, <clears throat> so here's the thing, like just, just run the math. Right. Uh, anybody that's listening, uh, just run the math. So you have an outbound motion. The outbound motion is, you know, uh, SDRs, cold calling people who are sort of, you know, uh, uh, they're not intent. Uh, even if you're layering in sort of intent data, I'm, you know, uh, that's a whole different discussion about intent data, but the you know the outbound motion of calling people and just playing the playing the numbers uh i'm going to get you know a two percent two and a half percent three percent uh lead to demo attend ratio and i'm going to close x percent of those those that math is is only doable if you have a really high ltv high acv type product right? Or service. Um, and it works, you know, for enterprise and, you know, the math makes sense. Uh, but when you have a, a lower LTV, lower ACV product, uh, or a product led, you know, kind of, kind of product, you, you, you've got to have some, or service, uh, you've got to have something that is going to be able to bring people to the door at scale and be able to, you know, ever, I mean, those just, again, run the, run the same math equation. You know, you've got a certain number of demo requests that are coming in or free trial starts to your product. You know, you're converting those because they are high intent. These are people that are actually raising their hand and saying, I'm interested in that thing you've got, because I think it might solve the pain point I've got. And, and they are coming to you with that problem. All you have to do is answer their questions and give them the same kind of uh, consultative, you know, approach that, you know, that they're sort of used to, you know, with your brand to begin with. And what ends up happening as you play it out in the math, you're closing at a higher percentage, much, much higher percentage, you know, in the 20s, 25% plus range. And you're closing faster because they're already motivated and high intent. And so what ends up happening is they close faster. Your sales cycle is shorter, right? All of a sudden you have this entire uh, uh, model running. And then the question becomes, how do you scale it, right? So you already know that those inbound demo requests and, and uh, you know, are going to be the best ones. The question is, is how do you scale it? And then you've connected the dots. And, you know, based on what I've just heard you say, what you said is, is I knew that those are going to be my best opportunities. And so I'm going to go out and I'm going to create content. I'm going to go speak at events. I'm going to set myself up as an authority with credibility. I'm going to help people with, you know, uh, webinars or what have you, right? You know, that, that delivers value at a one to many kind of scale. And, yeah. and, and that is the fundamental difference, I think, between, uh, you know, a, an agency that, that is successful right now and the ones that are struggling right now. Um, yeah. and, and I see a lot of them that are struggling right now. And it's, you know, when I look at them and they, they, they ask questions, one of the, one of my responses is, is what are the things that you're doing, you know, outside of, you know, the, you know, focusing on the existing business. What are you doing that actually attracts new customers to your brand or, you know, to your, you know, to your website. And to me, you know, brand is not, you know, color schemes and logos and things <laughs> like that. Brand is what people understand about what it is that you do. Right. And, yeah. and, and how clear they are in that, you know, in your, yeah. you, you and, and I think the, the content and, you know, and speaking in front of a state on a stage in front of, you know, 300 marketers is content. Right. And then you're probably taking yeah. that content and doing other things with it. And, 
So I, I love, I love how that works because it's so simple. I mean, it's, it's, you got to know your subject matter, right? But there's not anybody, I mean, if your company or your, or your agency is good, uh, you have plenty of subject matters in your organization that, you know, can create that kind of level of content. Yeah. Then the question is, is really like, how do you scale it? How do you distribute it? And that's a, probably a different episode that we can, we can go down. But, oh, I would love to. Yeah. There's so many truths in that, Eric. So many truths. In. You know, the bottom line is if you have to convince someone to work with you, you've done something very long. If, if you're in a proposal consultative stage and they're like, so why should I buy from you? you you've skipped an enormous step at the front of all this, like you said. Yeah. Because yeah. your reputation, your brand should precede you. And, and, you know, the proposal is about the client, not about you. Um, and to your point about scalability as well, you know, the best proof for me that it works is, um, you know, obviously when we started out, it was just me, but when we hired our first advertising strategist in the business development department to do everything we're talking about doing, right. Um, servicing leads with whatever they need and closing opportunities. His closing rate in his first quarter company was 28%. And, you know, that's with us not even trying, you know, if we wanted to that, you know, if we wanted to do all the hard stuff on social, that I'm sure it could be 40, 50. Yeah. But with this so-called soft approach, still 28, like you said, in, in, in you said 20, mid twenties. So it works, but like you said, I think that the moral of the story here, you know, to wrap up this enormous tangent is. Interesting tangent I might add is, so uh, you, you can't just buy your way out of a, of a hole. You can't just buy your way into a market. You do have to earn it. And then yeah. the closing part is a lot easier. Yeah. I, oh, we, we could spend so much more time on this and I know we're cutting, you know, we're, we're, we're on the end of it, but I, I, uh, I honestly think we should get back on one of these and we should talk more about what that looks like because that right there mm -hmm. is another two hour conversation <laughs> about yeah. you know how do you how how do you take uh and build demand you know how do you take and build and then uh build a machine that captures that demand and turns them into you know closed one deals um uh, how do you take them and turn them into clients you know how do you take them and turn them into you know, customers that are, you know, that are, that are, um, you know, going through a, a an onboarding process, you know, wh whatever the, you know, whatever your particular, um, success metric is. Uh, and I want to talk about that. And then I also want to talk about how you, when you talk about ROIing your services, I want to talk a little bit about that too. I want to dig into that question. So maybe, maybe this is actually a good place to pause. We're not going to call this the end of the episode. We're just going to cause this the intermission. Pause. Pause. Yeah, this is the intermission <laughs> and we're going to come back with a different episode. We're going to, we're going to dive into a couple of those things. Cause I'm, I'm fascinated by how people that are doing it right. Um, like how they approach, you know, how they approach it and how they sort of lay it out. We can, we can dive into that. That'd be fun. I'd love to. I'll thank you for listening to part one. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Jack, Jack, this has been a lot of fun, man. I, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for spending some time with me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. You too.